Hi, this is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association, and welcome to AFCA Roundtables. Today we're speaking with Spike Lee, Delroy Lindo, and Jonathan Major about The Five Bloods, the new Netflix uh, movie that will air on June 12th. And now let me introduce you to the AFCA members participating in today's call. We have Katia in Philadelphia, Mercedes in F Pittsburgh, Thomasina in Philadelphia, Rebecca in Chicago, Emmanuel in Chicago, Carla in Los Angeles, Ruben in Florida, South Florida, Al in South Florida, Rhonda in Atlanta, Ray in Atlanta, Kim Ford in Atlanta, and we have Ed Adams, the voice of God. All right, uh, this is Emmanuel Noisette from uh, E-Man's Movie Reviews in Chicago. Uh, Mr. Lindo, Mr. Majors, Mr. Lee, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank Mr. You. Lee, this question is for you. Um, in The Five Bloods, you use the Vietnam War to depict the complicated relationship between patriotism, the American dream, and being Black in America. Recently, we've had people like Drew Brees disagree with Kaepernick's taking a knee to the protest to police brutality, and he also tried to invoke uh, his grandparents who fought in uh, World War II. I know you are a supporter of Cap's protest. Should Drew, should Drew Brees watch The Five Bloods, and what do you think he'll get from it? I'm, I'm talking to the Saints. I'll just leave it at that. Mm. You mean you're officially talking to the New Orleans Saints organization? You're, you're talking yeah. to them? Okay. Yeah. okay. If, if, We're going to try to do something. I'll just leave it at that because it hasn't if, happened yet. If that's the but case. I reached, out, I reached out the New Orleans Saints football team. If that's the case, Mr. Lindo, uh, what would your character say to Drew Brees? Oh, shit. No, 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 no. His character no. or Delroy himself? Let me, I'm, I'm keeping it movie let's, related. So, let's, Paul, the character, yeah. what would well, he say on. to Drew Brees? Can, I, can, I answer, can, I, can, can Delroy answer that question? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Not <Yeah>. his character. <laughs> yeah, let, let me let Delroy answer. First of all, uh, I, I have to admit, I knew nothing about this. I didn't, I didn't know anything about Drew Brees responding. Uh, so Delroy would you say- You apologized yesterday though. Oh, good. So I would say this, um, watch the film if you want to and don't watch it if you don't want to. It's entirely up to you. What I would say regarding his reaction to Cap taking a knee, um, I would say respectfully, you're wrong. I would also say respectfully, talk to Colin Kaepernick, talk because what happened with him taking a knee, that narrative was kidnapped away from Colin Kaepernick. It was Hi, kidnapped away from him. Mm -hmm. And so it became something that it was not. So I would say to Drew Brees, if you want to go see the film, see it or not. Um, I would say regarding whatever your reaction is, your response to Cap taking the knee, go talk to Colin Kaepernick so you will hopefully have a broader context for why he did that in the first place. That is, that is Delroy's uh, uh, response. Paul's response, whatever, motherfucker. You know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, whatever. What the fuck? That's Paul's, that's Paul's response. Hello, gentlemen. Kathy Woods out of Philadelphia. Um, the one thing that I love about this movie is a topic that we don't talk about enough, which is the plight of the Black veteran. And piggybacking off Emmanuel's um, question, the thing that, that is failing, obviously, in our teaching is that conversation. What in your life do you feel? What do you feel this project will finally do, I hope, is open up the conversation about black veterans, their contribution, and also how they've been received. Um, in, re in, in preparing for this film, I happen to have two cousins. Uh, my wife is from Philadelphia. Uh, I, I have, yay. Uh, I talked to two of my cousins who are vets who live in Philly. Uh, I talked to them about their um, overall um, experiences in Nam. Um, but specifically about their struggles negotiating P PTSD. Um, one of my cousins in particular, who's had a much more difficult time coming to terms with his PTSD, 
absolutely feels neglected. They feel violated in terms of how they were react, how they were responded to when they came back from Nam. Uh, I hope this work serves as a corrective to all those vets and not just the black vets, but the black vets in particular because of the manner in which their contribution has been broadly ignored. So it's been a violation on top of a violation, right? So what I'm hoping is that this film serves as a corrective to that from a historical point of view, from a cultural point of view, and from a quote unquote entertainment point of view. Thank you. Thank you. To that. No, no, I, I would just say, if I could add to that, I am the, uh, the grandson and the son of war veterans. Uh, my grandfather, uh, one fought in the Vietnam War, one fought, and he also fought in the Korean War, and then my other grandfather fought in World War II. My father also fought in Desert Storm. And I think what I see in the film is that it's an acknowledgement. It's an acknowledgement mm -hmm. that you were there, uh, that you were seen, and that you, that's your value. And the one thing I love, one of the many things I love about the film is that you have multiple vets and you see that there are different types of experiences for every different soldier, every different warrior that decided to fight for this country. Paul has one experience, Otis has a different experience, Norm, et cetera. They all have their own experiences with it. And so the simple acknowledgement that you were there, that you count, to me is a huge contribution uh, that this film makes. Good afternoon, gentlemen. This is Thomasina out of Philly. And my question is for Mr. Lindo. Um, it was very easy to hate or feel heartbroken for the Paul character. I want to ask you how easy or difficult it was to relate to him and his viewpoints in this film. When you say his viewpoints, are you speaking specifically about the political, the Trumpian aspect, or just in general, broadly? The um, broadly, really, broadly. His political okay. viewpoints, family-wise, like it was really difficult to agree with a lot of the actions that he took in the film mm -hmm. and, his, and his thought processes. So I'm going to um, bifurcate my, my answer. I'm going to bifurcate my, um, my response, and I'm going to first speak about, um, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. I could relate to what I, what I came to understand about Paul is that the reason and this was my own creative, internal creative process, personal to me. Um, Spike and I did not discuss this per se. What I came to, the understanding that I came to is that Paul has suffered a great deal of betrayal, not least of which the betrayal and the violation he experienced coming back from Vietnam, the manner in which the country responded to him. Um, not only is that very much in keeping with the experience, the real life experience of vets being rejected and being vilified um, for what they did, um, Paul, that was Paul's experience. Um, in addition to, and it also comports entirely with what one of my cousins in particular said happened to him when he came home. So I related, uh, uh, as far as Paul's concerned, he was violated and rejected and abandoned in terms of how he was responded to. It's very important to understand about Paul. He volunteered. He was not drafted. He volunteered three tours. And at the end of those three tours, he comes back to this. So there's that kind of betrayal, the loss of my wife. There are also um, various other betrayals that have happened to Paul um, that I created for my biography I at Delroy, I relate to all of that. I relate to the betrayal. I relate to the abandonment. So from that standpoint, that was a win, not a window. That was part of the conduit that I used in order to get into creating Paul. Specifically with regard to the Trumpian piece, I arrived at the at the point where I said, okay, I have experienced all of this abandonment and betrayal, which has culminated in a profound disconnectedness, a profound disenfranchisement from the society of which I am supposed to be a part. Here comes this individual in 2015 who says, I can make it right. I can make it right for you. I can change this. 
And I could see how in the face of all of the abandonment and all of the rejection and all of the loss, cumulatively and all of the feeling that builds up as a result of those things that I would take a pitcher of Kool-Aid and drink it when this man comes along and says, I can make it better for you. That's Thank, my you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. This is Carla Renata, the Kirby Critic. This question that I have is specifically for Jonathan, but the rest of you gentlemen are more than welcome to pipe in if you'd like. Um, I, too, am a daughter of a Vietnam vet. And so, Jonathan, I was wondering what your thoughts are regarding the psychological effects for someone who is the child or the grandchild of a Vietnam vet, especially for our younger generation, now that we are currently in this kind of martial law, civil war situation going on? That's a great question. I think being the child of, of the child and, and the grandchild of war vets, there are tremendous benefits first and foremost. You learn a certain amount of discipline, a certain amount of stoicism, a certain amount of um, ingenuity, um, and you're active. You, you know to be active. Um, the things I've noticed and the things I experienced uh, growing up is that there's a frustration that they have. Um, in, in, in my cases where they have, they've been given all these tools. They've been trained to be not just a citizen, but a soldier, right? They have the intellect of a soldier. They have the body of a soldier. They have the engine of a soldier. And then they've come home in most cases and they've been told, yeah, you can't use these tools anymore. And so there's a frustration and unrest that's in them. And as the son and the grandson of one, there's a reason why I didn't join the military because I saw how that uh, in some ways crippled them. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, uh, bo both my grandfathers lived on farms in isolation, you know, and they would come into town, right, to deal with things, to deal with things. And so what I learned from that, and what I would say to young people who are dealing with, you know, a patriarch or a matriarch, a father or a mother um, who has been in that service is to do in, a way what I did in working with uh, Deroy as my father, as Paul, you look at them, you see their strengths and you have a choice as their child. You can either become them or you can compliment them. And so the soldier mentality that my father has in the film and in life, I decided to compliment, right? In order to move the major's family forward, the Anderson family forward. We've already got our soldier. I'm gonna give you an actor. I'm gonna give you an intellectual. Right, because we are one. Um, that's what I would say. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello, everyone. My name is Mercedes Williams. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, my question is two part fold, um, but it's both it's for Mr. Lee and Mr. Lindo. Crooklyn is my all time favorite movie, and that's because at that time it was a family for larger families, a family we had not seen before. So, Mr. Lee and Mr. Lindo. What is it like um, working in this atmosphere? Again, you spoke about it a little bit earlier, Mr. Lee. What is it like working with each other? And how is um, this movie a little bit different than the other ones that you guys have previously worked on together? Well, if, if I may go first, uh, yeah. each, each, each film has been a different experience with Delroy because each film we're telling a different story. Right. So there's Delroy has been a minute between this film and the last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Delroy, I promise you, it's not gonna be that long. <laughs> you ain't gonna have that, that gap. So that's what we're gonna answer it, you know? It started in, with the, uh, we shot Malcolm X in 91, it came out in 92. Here we are in 20, in the year of our Lord, 2020. And it's a good, and it's a good continue. I'll say this, one thing that is, um, Mercedes, <clears throat> one thing that is um, uh, similar about all four projects, the similarity for me is that Spike in inviting me to be a part of his projects has gifted me with these brilliant characters, these wonderful characters to play as an actor, right? Um, 
And even though, and I was talking about this yesterday with somebody, even though West End and Archie is only in a three hour film for probably, I don't know, 10 minutes, 12 minutes overall. It was more than that. Was it really? Okay. Um, but come on, it took you, Delroy, it took you 10 minutes to slump over. <laughs> Oh, love. I remember it was like no, it was like we shot that like four o'clock in the morning, yeah, and did. I kept like have to try to hit my head. <laughs> we all were, man. It was cold outside. It was four in the morning. We were all tired. Yeah, um, yeah. But but <clears throat> the impact of, of West Indian Archie was such that um, I consider an audience have considered uh, West Indian Archie to be a significant part of that film. Yes. So then we moved to. Uh, Woody Carmichael, when Spike calls me up and says, I want you to do this. Then the following summer, he calls me up and says, hey man, I'm doing this film, Clockers, I want you to do this. That's a gift to any actor, that a creative worker of Spike's stature would just call you and say, hey man, come do this. And not only the invitation to participate in the work, but the content of the part, right? Now with Rodney, with Rodney Little, I don't know, we've never really talked about this, Spike, but when, when people found out that I was playing Rodney in Clockers, as opposed to the Keith David character, everybody said, well, man, knowing you, I would have thought you would be playing the Keith David part. Mm -hmm. But the affirmation from Spike as a fellow worker to say, no, I see this man's talent more broadly than that. And you can do Rodney. And even though Rodney is very different from my own personality, and I have to work my butt off to kind of find that character, the fact that this man, as a colleague, says, no, I see you. I see your talent, and I see the breadth of your talent, and you can do this. Fast forward to 2020 now, when he, calls, when he called me up last year and said, hey, man, I want you to come do this. Um, and I read it. And once we got past, once I got past the Trumpian piece, <laughs> I called and said, hey, man, I'm in. I need, not only do I want to do this, I need to do this. So the, the answer to your question is, um, certainly we've matured. But what's similar about all four um, experiences is that I consider I have been given a gift by being uh, invited into uh, this, this world and to play such terrific characters. That's a gift for any actor. And Frank, that's why I went to acting school. I couldn't have dreamed. Um, I couldn't have written it any better for myself as an actor. You will meet uh, 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 one of the premier film filmmakers in the world, and he will invite you in to participate in his creative journeys. Thank you. Well, we love all three of you, especially during these hard times. Thank you. Mercedes, hey. Mercedes can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yes. Who killed Queen? Who killed the dog? Yeah. Queenie? <laughs> Queenie. 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 I'm positive her adopted daughter killed Queenie. <laughs> she didn't kill Queenie. <laughs> hey, listen, I want to just, uh, just really quickly go back to the previous question with regard to the, the young lady from the Curry, the Curvy, the Curvy Critic. Um, I wanna I wanna say something about the youth. Um, you 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 asked on the tail end of your question, you know, what would you say to the youth? And and I know that you were speaking about perhaps uh, young people who may be um, uh, who may have parents who are veterans. But I wanna just take a more broad um, answer to your question. Appreciate it. Okay, so given that the youth, very similar to the 60s, the civil rights movement in the 60s, the youth are at the forefront of what's happening. The youth are at the forefront of the rejection of the status quo that's happening right now. And white, so white, say, white, kids, white kids are joining us. White kids too. And it's not only an American phenomenon, it's become a global phenomenon. What I would say to the youth currently is, whatever your pers personal circumstances are, and anybody who has seen the video of that young lady who shot that cop in Minneapolis, traumatized, talking about her experience standing there and filming, that young lady is traumatized. But what I would say, despite whatever your 
personal circumstances may be and your personal traumas and pain, the fact that the youth are the vanguard of the rejection of the status quo is such an aff a profoundly affirming thing. And it gives me as an old head, as and I, I'm a parent of a soon to be 19 year old African American man child. And I have all of the concerns and anxieties and fears that go along with that. But what I would say is, given that the youth are at the forefront of this rejection, that's affirming to me. And it gives me some hope for the future, not only of this country, but of the world, because the young people are bringing it right now. Bringing it. Bringing it. Thank you for that. Thank you so God. much. God bless you. Thank you. Um, I'm Rebecca Ford, and I have a question for Spike Lee. Where are you, um, where are you Rebecca? Here. Where's no, here? In, in, in Chicago. Chicago. OK, Chi-town, OK. Yes. It's uh, also known as Chirac by some. Uh, yeah. So this is changing. Let's not, let's not, oh, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so this is kind of changing the temperature of the questions a little bit, but I, uh, I have a couple questions that are all kind of related to like the marketing of the movie. And so are you happy with the way Netflix is promoting your film? Well, I'm very now? happy with the way Netflix well, is, is doing this. They're listening to me. You know, uh, you know, marketing is one of my things. I just don't make a film and just dip out, you know. So I'm involved on all, everything involved. Oh, well, that's really positive. I mean, the related question that I have is that, so now we're in COVID era and everything is streaming, but in the future, let's say next year, when we're kind of like over this, how do you see the balance of, <laughs> like streaming and theatrical for, or what would be ideal for you for the balance between streaming and theatrical for your, for your movies? And then how do you measure the box office on streaming? Well, you measure the back, the, the box office by streaming what they'll tell you, you know, what they'll tell you because they know exactly how many people are getting, you know, watching your thing. They know how long, it's a science. They got all the, the everything. They know when you saw it, what time, if you put it on pause, I mean, it goes on, 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 on. But I think that for me, it's going to be a minute before the masses of people run back to movie theaters, especially after, you know, before there's a vaccine. But I am happy, though, that on June 12th, this film is going to be streamed all over this God's planet. Mm. And more people are going to see this film than any, than any of my films in the past, ever. So that and you know, like this, is, this, is a, this is the right time, too, you know? Yeah. This is the work of the Almighty, you know? This thing, you know, the way everything, you know, worked out. You know, of course, many people have died in this, you know. Uh, you know, we're talking about our, here's the thing I like to say real quick. You know, we all talk about what this epidemic, how it's changed our life. What about the people who died? We can look at like, we can flip it like that. That's the ultimate change. Mm -hmm. They're no longer here with us. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All of the things that Spike just articulated um, point, and I do not want to jinx this, but all of the things that Spike just articulate, articulated, look, I would have loved to have gone to Cannes, right? But the adjustments that have been made and the fact that Netflix, Spike, have been flexible enough. And ultimately, he ends up saying, more people will see this film uh, than have seen any of my other films. To me, that is indicative, uh, even in the context of this pandemic, that is indicative of the fact that I believe this work is anointed. I believe that. 
Um, I don't know what the future holds, but I do believe that this work is anointed. And I'll tell you a really quick anecdote story. Jonathan heard this yesterday. We were filming in Thailand and we were doing the scene in which uh, I leave the bloods and I go off into the jungle. And I put on that hat and I say, I'm out. And I walk off into the jungle. And as I was walking off into the jungle, the sky opened up, major torrential storm hit. Uh, wind, rain, it, the sky opened up. Yep. Spike Lee- At that came, exact moment. At that exact moment, hold up, hold up. Spike Lee kept the cameras rolling. The sound man kept the sound going. I commenced to improvise something. He kept the film rolling. I don't know for how long, but until I disappeared off into the jungle. He kept the, the, the film rolling. The sound man kept his thing going. I kept improvising. At cut, and by this time it's storming. We're all, we're all running for the vans and going back to base camp. But my point is, A, right, <laughs> got the scene. Extraordinarily, the sound guy got the sound. Yeah. He got it. And at that point, it felt to me like a literally a gift from God. We could not have planned it like that. And that's the scene that's in the film. We couldn't have planned it happening like that. But at that point, God said, go ahead, y'all. I'm going to give you all this. It felt to me in that instance, and I did not talk to Spike. I didn't think, oh, my God, this is anointed. But in retrospect, I'm saying that was an anointed moment because that was something that just happened completely by accident, and it was contained and captured and is now part of the film. Which Let me jump real quick because, Delroy, that happened with, with uh, Denzel and Malcolm X. Malcolm X, yeah, right. The scene is the scene where you see the big portrait of, the, of Elijah Muhammad behind him. And as we got to the end of the, all the script, all the, his speeches were Malcolm's words. So I'm standing next to Ernest Dickerson, my great cameraman, and I'm looking at the script so I can call cut when Denzel is at the end. So right about the right when we get to call cut, Denzel kept going. <laughs> I said, Ernest, don't cut, don't cut. <laughs> and finally, Ernest and Spike were we rolled out. <laughs> so I go to Denzel. I said, Denzel, that's great. Where did that come from? He said, Spike. I don't know what I just said. Yeah. I cannot tell you what I just said. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I'm, I'm thank you for saying that because it's the same thing as sports. <laughs> With MJ, <laughs> Muhammad Ali, when we get in the zone, <laughs> oh. <laughs> when we get to the zone, we're yeah. at another level. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't know where this shit's coming from, but we're gonna ride it. <laughs> Swear yeah. to God, when you yeah. hit the zone, you hit it. Yeah. And the zone don't hit. It, and also, it's very rare you gonna do your job, but sometimes the highest highs, where we want to call it the spirit. It takes over. Here's the thing, though. I'm gonna. I know. I'm, I don't want to. I knew you got other questions, but, but that. Excuse my language. That shit doesn't happen unless you're open to it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. You have to be open to it. If you're closed up, if if your if your stuff is in handcuffs, it's not. You're not gonna. You're not gonna be able to, to take it in. Yeah. So your soul and spirit. Gotta be correct. Yes. Because <laughs> yes. if shit ain't correct, <laughs> you're not gonna be blessed. Amen. Amen. And that's, well, I that's totally true. agree with that. I've, I've seen it not just with, with my brother Doro or Denzel. I've seen it in my eyes, courtside in the garden with, with, with MJ. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Chicago originally myself, and I'm with uh, yeticket.com. But I got to say, you talked a whole lot, Spike, and a good, it's great seeing you again. We didn't met about five, six times. And, uh, but anyway, here's, here's my point. First of all, I am a Vietnam veteran myself. Oh, my wow. brother got killed in 
1970 on his birthday. And many of my friends went to Vietnam and, and suffered. And I never saw their stories in the film. And Spike, my question to you is, why did it take so long for the Black or the African American soldier story to get on film? They have pieces of it in different stories. And Delroy and Jonathan, did you really feel them, the African American soldier, did you really feel how they really felt or how they were treated while they were in the military? Uh, growing up in Brooklyn, New York, my late brother, Chris, we loved to watch those World War II films. Mm -hmm. Films like The Train with Burt Lancaster, It's Paris Burning. We loved those films. And my father would see his two sons, young sons watching this stuff. He'd say, boys, black folks were in World War, World War II also. My father had flat feet, so he was 4F. He didn't get drafted. But his two brothers, my uncle, Arnold, uncle Clarence, they in World War II. They were in the big Red Express. They drove the trucks that supplied Patton's army. And so my father was telling us. Now, the Vietnam War, I'm still going, the Vietnam War was the first war that was televised into American homes. 67, I'm 10 years old. 68, I'm 11 years old. I remember my mother screaming down the street, hysterically yelling that they've just murdered them crackers is my mother's words, my late mother's word, them crackers assassinated Dr. King. So I was young enough to know what's going on, but young enough still not to be drafted. When we came back from Thailand and Vietnam, and we edited the film, before I showed it to Netflix, I had four separate screenings for black and black and Puerto Rican. Dominicans weren't here in New York yet. <laughs> they came later. Black and Puerto Rican Vietnam vets. And they and also it was very emotional. There was at each screening, some of these brothers had to get up and leave. Go out in the lobby and compose themselves. After each screening, I just listened to them. And at the end of the movie, they all hugged me and said, Spike, thank you for making this film. Because they've been waiting. And they said, Spike, I'm going to quote them now. What took you so fucking long? <laughs> ah. That's what they said. They said, we love Miracle St. Anna, World War II, but you know, you weren't even born then. So we, we, we've been waiting for you, Spike. <laughs> and for me, all jokes aside, and to you, brother, who's a Vietnam vet, I made this film for you guys. <laughs> for you. And you guys have validated the film. So I don't want to hear what nobody else says. You guys who at the age of 17, 18, 19, right. teenagers, right. Yeah. whether you enlisted or drafted, got shipped halfway around the world to the front lines. To the front lines, that's right. To the front lines to die for this country, knowing that what all soldiers, uh, since Christmas addicts, who's the first person to die in the American war, the revolution, uh, the American Revolutionary War against the English, died at uh, the Boston Massacre. So you guys have paid uh, a deep, deep price. And so this film was, is to honor and salute. Thank you. Salute you. But you're right though. When you ask me, I mean, the same thing you asked me, what took you so long? <laughs> that's what they said, those screeners. Like, God damn, Spike. <laughs> what took you so long? And then my answer was 
Timing is everything. Mm. This is when the film was supposed to be made. And now look what has happened in the world. Right. Since we started to shoot. So this is some, and, and, and I'm gonna borrow your word, Delroy. This maybe this is some anointed work. Maybe it was, you know. And then also my other point is you use Marvin Gage, what's going on? That was our national anthem. Man, we're getting our barracks, whatever, you know, do our that's, thing. That's we why we use it. Over and over. That's why I used it. And also, that was a song. That was what you guys were listening to. Oh, we were. Now, are the, are the characters named after the Temptations? <laughs> you were the third person to peep that. <laughs> the yeah. characters of the Five Bloods are named after the original Tempting Temptations. temptations. Yes. And you were the third person, not the first, not Segundo. <laughs> For those who speak Spanish, <laughs> but the third. Thank you very much. Those are bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, Thank this you. is uh, Ray from Atlanta. Uh, Spike, good w to see you. Ray, Ray. Out, Ray. Yeah. Works at WCOK. I was on the air, was at Morehouse at W C L K. Have my own radio show. <laughs> Ray, am I lying? No, you're not lying. You're not lying. You're not lying. Guys, congratulations on this great film. Uh, I actually kind of have a have a two part. I want to start with with Jonathan and Delroy. Thank you so very much for this film. Uh, I want to say this is kind of the first time that we've seen a father son. Uh, movie in a long time, a black father son movie in a long time, and also dealing with the Vietnam War. But I also saw it as a, uh, a uh, passing of the torch, if you will. So to Jonathan and to Delroy, did you guys, Delroy, did you kind of see that? And Jonathan, did you see that working around such amazing actors like Delroy, like Norm Lewis, uh, like the, the, uh, the other characters, did you kind of see that as a passing of the torch with you and Chad, with Chadwick being in this film? I think the beautiful thing about any actor, director, um, artist who gets the title of great or legend um, or goat is that they carry with them a great deal of humility and a great deal of vulnerability. And specifically with uh, Norm Lewis and Delroy Lindo and Clark Peters and Isaiah Whitlock, I experienced that a great deal of, uh, I received and perceived a great deal of humility from those fellas. And the beautiful thing that Spike did is he kind of put, you know, when you get picked, you get picked. You, it's your number and you're up, you know, you're in the game. And there's no time to check your shoelaces, it's go time, you know? And the, the it was like they passed the ball to me. They said, okay, you got it, go, boom. That way, we're going that way. And the amount of trust and faith they put in me as a young black man, as a young artist, um, as an actor, uh, was it was quite emboldening, you know. And it did feel like, okay, you're not passing the torch. We're doing this together, right? We're now building this together, right? And, and you know, what happens after this is a great friendship, uh, a, a mentorship, um, a community of less 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 discourse, you know, because they're gonna keep going, and I'm a, I'm gonna continue. You know, so we kind of run together. So the whole tribe gets stronger. It's almost like you've added somebody to the army. You've added somebody to the roster. You know, those guys are going to sit down. They're going to keep playing and let the young boy also play with them, right? And the whole gang, we're, we collectively, the new blood, the young blood, the old blood, the old heads, we change the DNA of the culture collectively. Uh, so that's what it felt like to me. Uh, Jonathan has... Um articulated so eloquently and, and, it, and it echoes what I said at the beginning of this talk. Um, because he came, even though he is, you know, a, a young blood and we're the old heads, so, 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 so called, he came as an equal. Uh, me personally, it became, it was very clear to me um, after being around Jonathan for a relatively short period of time, what he is about as a man, as a human being on the planet, as a man, as a black man, 
as a conscious black man and as a creator, as a creative worker, as a fellow creative worker. It was clear to me what he was about after being around him um, for a relatively short period of time. Therefore, coming to those determinations about him, and it's not that I was consciously having this discussion in my head, it was much more organic than that, frankly. But that feeling about him then uh, um, um, translated effortlessly into the work. And you talk about, you know, the father's son, it just became, it just enhanced the whole process. Yeah. He is my son, me as his father, and we all have fathers and we all have whatever our relationship is with our fathers. My father was absent in my life. It, he was absent physically. Um, it does not mean he, he was absent physically, but his absence psychologically and emotionally marked me in a certain kind of way. So to pick up in this film and to have a fractious um, relationship with my son, it was rich because of the mutual regard and respect that we had for each other and the time that we spent together, it enriched the whole process. And I wanna say one thing, um, in that fractiousness that was there, part of that fractiousness was the love that was there. Yep. And I'm hoping that audiences, and, and based on the, the, the conversations that I've had, I'm hoping that that love is evident in the relationship and in what people are seeing when we are working, to, when we are being together in this film. And if you think about it, in the final analysis, the, um, the fact that inside of a, a, a fractious relationship, there can still be love and there can still be love that's evident in the final analysis, that's very human. Mm. And one of the strengths of this film, as far as I am concerned, is it, it shows these men all their foibles, all their faults in the final and loving each other. And in the final analysis, what we are doing, what Spike is doing as the storyteller, what we are doing, uh, participating in this, is showing our humanness. Yeah. And in the world, in the planet, across the globe, that's one of the basic problems for Black people, that those other folk refuse to acknowledge our, the fact that we are human and we are deserving of being treated as humans. When they get their heads around that, <laughs> we'll be fine, right? But that's, that's, kind of the, uh, that's kind of the cheat sheet for the film, isn't it? That's why the film is so important because they, we, what Spike has done, he's actually shown it. We're not just referencing it. We're, we're right. showing it. it is on the screen and we're not we're glimpsing it. it. It's not a little it. gap line in Hamburger Hill. It's not a little conversation down the road. It's an entire story. It's an entire narrative. When you see in the film, there's a moment where we are literally tied together. We won't say what's going on, but we're tied together. That is a symbol and a metaphor for what that relationship is. And I'm speaking as a young black man whose father was in and out, who has a seven-year-old daughter, who has looked for and reached for father figures my entire life. That connection that you have with your father, that we all have with our fathers, that I personally have with my father, is like life or death. You are tied to this man, and you I feel the only way to survive is to connect to him, right? Especially in times like this, we need the fathers. David needs Paul. And the entire mission, uh, specifically for David, right, is to get his father's love. That's the only reason he's there. That's the only reason he shows up. It is to get his father's love by any means. Gold had nothing to do with it. It ain't got nothing to do with the price of gas. It got nothing to do with it. <laughs> And I think, and I think that's novel. I think that's a that's a beautiful thing. You know, we they uh, August Wilson tried it in Fences, did a wonderful job at it. This is the first time I believe it's been seen in cinema. Hi, I'm Kim Ford here in Atlanta, and my question is for Spike. You know, Spike, your films have told the story of our culture for so many, like so many of us coming up, and even much younger than me are learning our history through your films. Mm. So, given that. Where do you see your filmmaking going, given what's going on in the culture right now? Thank you for the question. And uh, one of the things I made up my mind during the epidemic is that I'm going to take one day 
I'm going to take it day by day. And so I can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, I really don't know what's, what my next, where, where I'm going to go with my next film. That's too far ahead of time for me to, to spend time thinking about it. But thank you for the question. I want to go back a little bit to what Ray was saying. And one of the things that I appreciate about the Five Bloods is to see older Black men still active. Like these men still had hopes. They still had dreams. And also, I want you to also talk about, I see you playing a little bit more with directing techniques and you're advancing in your craft as well. So can you and Delroy Lindo speak specifically on being able to be in a project where people are not writing you off and death is not necessarily the whole point of you being there, but you're still actively living life. I read an interview by the great master Kuro Kurosawa, one of the great filmmakers of all time. He was in New York promoting his last film. And the journalist, who I can't remember his name, asked Mr. Kurosawa, in paraphrase, you know, you've done everything, you know everything, and is it anything left you to learn about cinema? And Kurosawa said, I mean, he's in his mid eighties now. He said, there's a universe for me to learn about cinema. And I was in film school when I read that. So right away that opened my eyes like, yo, you know, like you, you, you can't be static and think that you, you learned it all and you got it as long as you're doing it, you got to keep learning and be open to learn. So I think that's reflected in my, in my, in my filmmaking as the years have progressed. And also, I like to say is that right now, you know, I'm just mixing all, all mixing all up, you know, like a, a, like a gumbo from New Orleans, oh, oh. but without the pork and red meat. <laughs> Minus pork and red meat, I'm just throwing everything in that pot. Then you got to let it, you know, you can't eat it right away if you get a lot of simmer and all them juices. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the new spike joints have elevated to where you just throw it, throw it all in. You know, it doesn't have to be strictly one thing. So when, when uh, for example, so when Chadwick Boseman, my young brother, the character, Storm Norm is trying to teach his fellow buds, he cites Christmas addicts. So normally you just leave it like that. But this one, we cut to a portrait of Chris addicts. And then we, the very famous, then the other famous one of him being shot and killed at, at the first person to die for this country at the Boston massacre during the American Revolution. We talk about our young yeah. brother, Milton Olive, at the age of 18, threw his body on a grenade. All right, we're talking about it. Let's cut to his picture. Let the world see what this young brother looked like. Mm -hmm. 18 years old. Mm -hmm. We've been dying for this motherfucker, excuse my language. Or, or as, as Chadwick said, we've been dying for this bitch from the get-go. And maybe some people, especially young people, are good. oh, you know what? When I go home or after the movie's over, I'm going to Google Christmas Addicts. I'm going to Google Milton Oliver. And, and I, I've seen this before because many people come to me Delroy, you know this. Many people came up to me and said, I had never read the autobiography of Malcolm X as told Alex Haley till they saw the movie. Right. Yeah. The movie made him go pick that up. Mm -hmm. And excuse me if I'm shouting, but I'm hyped. <laughs> um, let me just, you, you said something that's really critical. You said, I, you said words to the effect that here you're seeing mature black men, um, and you said the 
the death of the black men is 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 not the point. You said something like that, correct? Oh yeah, I'm saying that they these men still have hopes and dreams. They still have aspirations. Like a lot of times when you see men at this stage in their life or you know just actors in general at this, the characters in general at this stage in their life, it's like they're preparing to die. Whereas these men most had a lot of living, they still had hopes and aspirations and things that they wanted to achieve. So, and I know that I don't see that often on screen. Okay, so let me say as a, as a um, for Paul, um, for all these men in this film, they are about the business of achieving something very special and particular to all of them. So that parallels, that speaks to what you're saying, right? I will also tell you that for myself as an actor, you know, of a certain age, um, I'm still, it, it feels extraordinary to me uh, to be living, to be still working, you know, at my age and feel that I still have as much to give and to offer as I did when I started. And I genuinely feel that. And I would say that my um, participation in this particular project is the absolute manifestation of that. Because and what I mean, more specifically, you know, I've spent the last four years doing a television series. Um, and um, while that has been rewarding on many levels, um, and I want to be very careful what I say and how I say it right now, but that has been rewarding on many levels, working with good actors, and we're all working seriously as actors to, to achieve an end. But the TV, the format of TV, and the speed with which television gets done, it's a certain paradigm. And sometimes working in television, you got to get your head around the fact this is what it is and you have to work within these parameters. Coming to the five bloods, what I've been saying, <laughs> Spike let me go, man. He let me go. There was nothing that we talked about, but in terms of the paradigm of film, also in terms of how this story was unfolding and in terms of how, look, much of it was on the page, a lot of it, 98% of it was on the page in terms of what I was presented with. But still, and I said this yesterday, when there were moments in which I wanted to add something, and this is true for all of the actors, if you wanted to add a little something here and there, improvise off, off script, if it worked for the story, and if it, if it um, enhanced the narrative, Spike let me, he let us go. No, boy, can I just jump real quick? Yeah, go ahead. What about uh, Isaiah's line? You put the gold on Craigslist? Yeah, yeah that's, great. that's a great line. That's a great line. <laughs> or that when you yeah, said yeah, that, yeah. I was dying. <laughs> or, or the improvisation, that little thing he said when we were in the lobby of the hotel. The, the, there was elbow room for us to live and breathe and create and contribute. And for me, um, that was not only was it liberating creatively, but it says to me, I'm at a point, I'm at a point in my career where I've still got so much to give. And I pray and I hope that I find myself in creative situations moving forward to your to your question, uh, Rhonda, that will allow that. I'm not naive enough to think every situation will be like that. And frankly, Bloods is particular and special. It does not happen. It doesn't come around every day. Jonathan will tell you that. We'll all, it doesn't come around every day. But the fact that I've gotten to experience this in this way and to interact with people who are, have such a huge appreciation for the work um, is an affirmation for me moving forward as, a, as an actor of a certain age. I've still got lots to give. I'm still, I'm not, I'm not thinking about, you know, kicking my feet up and sitting on the couch anytime soon. I got a whole bunch to continue to give. And um, in certain areas of the entertainment industry, one is not always given credit for having that, that much to contribute. 
I like so. to piggyback on on, on um, Delroy's comment about uh, you know just with things improv. One of the scenes, which is one of the most powerful scenes in the film, really was no script for it. It's the scene where Delroy's in a boat and yeah. it's the chicken man. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's exactly right. Man. Look, here's the thing. We went into this film not wanting to demonize Vietnamese people, mm -hmm. like they've been in other films. Mm -hmm. Human beings. And one mm -hmm. of the key things, when I got there, my Vietnamese crew and cast members would remind me, Spike, stop saying the Vietnam War. It's the American War. Mm -mm 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 -mm. It was the French War before that, and the Chinese War before that. And think about it, China, France, the United States in that little country kicked them all in the ass. Yes. But yes. we just, that scene on the boat, my man could have speak any English. You know, I had to, you know how to say motherfucker, you know, when you kill my, you kill my mother and father, he can speak any English. He had to learn that on the spot. And Delroy, <laughs> Delroy, man. Oh. that thing got heated, and that was that was not staged. The no, back I... and forth, oh man, that scene! I mean, woo! And then, if you remember, if you remember, at the toward the end of the scene, uh, we were on the boat, and Spike was off, and we, the actors, came up with uh, from from my interacting with the Vietnamese cat. Oh yeah, chicken. and then we all we all improvised essentially the scene, and then we say, "Spike, Spike, let it. We, we're gonna show you what we did with this scene." And he and we we had the scene. We had improvised it. We had a shape to it. He came, Spike came onto the boat. He said, "Okay, show me what you show me what you got." We showed him, and he filmed it. The whole yeah. thing, the whole thing. Hi guys, my name is Ruben. I live in Miami, but uh, I'm from Dominican Republic. Dominican um, Republic. Yes, sir. I'm a good friend with Elvis. Yeah, Washington Heights. Yes. <laughs> That's my favorite area. Best food ever. And uh, something that, that Mr. Lee do in the movie is something that I, that I love, is that you put pieces of history of famous or non-famous Black person who, who make the difference in, in, in the past. And that happened also in Dominican Republic, like we, one of the founder fathers is black and we barely speak about him. And uh, I wanna know, and you kind of answered these questions before, but like, I wanna know, what did you decide to put these persons inside the movie, like a quick cut? And uh, I think like your movies make the difference in Latin American people because you tell stories about black people that we rarely see in, 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 in blockbusters. Usually we see that the, the movies that we got in my country is the black people at the top, the, the killers, the, the gangsters. But in your movies, you tell stories about black people who makes a difference, like Malcolm X, like all these characters that themselves portrayed, uh, cloakers, uh, like, I don't know, like many movies. And uh, what do you decide to tell these stories to make the difference? Growing, uh, thank you for the, the question, my Dominican brother. Growing up, my mother was a cinephile, and so she would drag me to movies, and a lot of these movies, you know, I liked, but, but uh, my father didn't go, didn't want to go because, you know, there were no black people in them. Yeah. So since my father didn't want to go, I was my mother's movie date. And, and now at that time, I didn't want to be a filmmaker. But when I did want to become a filmmaker, you know, it, it just, I mean, it wasn't a big deal for me to want to tell stories about, you know, the African-American experience. That, that was a natural thing. It was nothing, nothing I had to think long and hard about. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Spike, Jonathan, and Delroy. It's been terrific speaking with you. We look forward to supporting this project and your other work in the future. Please subscribe to the AFCA channel on YouTube and get notifications about who else we're speaking with.
have a great day.